Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff on the Mully and Haw Show. Dan Weeder from the Chicago Tribune. And we are talking about the Bears roster. They pared it down to 53 men today. Cut down day is here and gone. A lot of things that could be fluid and changing as well, Dan. We all know that the 53rd guy on the roster today, maybe even the 52nd, might not be there tomorrow. What is your first impression of, A, the Bears' overall depth of the roster, and B, any surprises in guys who either stayed or were leaving? Yeah, so for the first part of that question, I just think you're looking at a roster that feels ready to be competitive. You know, there's just quality depth in a lot of areas, most notably to me, as we've talked about all through August. It's the secondary, it's the running backs room. You feel like you've got some depth in those areas to withstand any sort of unfortunate setbacks on the injury front. You've got a team that looks like it's able to to, to put high-end talent at the skills positions out there, and that's going to allow you to put an entertaining product on the field on game days. The headline for me today is that Valus Jones has made the roster. We've been talking about that for the last few weeks. I give Valus a lot of credit for leaning into the position change that they had him uh, – embark on just a few weeks ago and then producing on game nights in the final three preseason games. I think he turned their heads a little bit with some of that production, had a lot of people in the building fighting for him uh, to the point where he now gets a chance to redefine himself as he goes into 2024 with a role uh, in this offense where obviously you're going to lean on him as a kick returner. And then you're going to try to find a niche for him every single week in some sort of way so that he can try to help impact your football team, even understanding that that football has got to go to a lot of different places. And we know how many good places it can go this year. I'll continue to say this, and it's it's still true after the rosters have been set, or at least today they're set. The decision on Bayless Jones, I don't think is going to affect anybody's projection for the bears in 2024. Correct. But I do think that a player like Bayless Jones gives a first time offensive coordinator like Shane Waldron more options than he has if he's not on the roster. And I think it's all about that. It's all about roster versatility and offensive diversity. And when you have a guy like Bayless Jones who runs as fast as he runs, then it gives you more options coming out of the backfield. I don't think he's going to play at wide receiver. I don't think he's going to get snaps instead of uh, Tyler Scott necessarily, and certainly not the first three guys on on the depth chart. So Velas Jones is a hybrid runner who maybe, maybe four to six plays a game gives you a chance to create a mismatch in the secondary against a strong safety or a linebacker who can't cover him. That's good if it converts one third down. We make a lot about these guys because he's been in some high profile mistakes and games yeah. that he helped he helped the Bears lose. But I think all along the the Valus must go campaign has been baffling to me because that's not the way the coaches are looking at this. They don't look at a way that they he can maximize the scheme and the talents and and make them look smarter just because he's faster than the guys that might be trying to defend him. Well, and I understand from a fan's perspective where the frustration would boil up. As you mentioned, there have been several high-profile gaffes, you know, uh, dropping touchdown passes in the end zone, not being able to handle punts, making game-losing mistakes in in game-losing moments, you know. And so you want to see him put his best foot forward and and, and be able to make good on that. But again, this roster now is at a a place where we don't have to fret about Bayless Jones. You know, we can look right. at Caleb Williams and DeAndre Swift and Keenan Allen and DJ Moore and Cole Komet and Roman Dunze and say, man, this offense is in really good shape. If they can get the offensive line solidified, if they can have cohesion up front there, Bayless Jones is going to be a subplot from August 27th tonight until January 23rd or whenever it is that they, they ultimately clean their locker out. You'll notice I, I gave you a date there that's into the playoffs there. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see we'll see where we head from there. Um, the other notable inclusion on the roster, I think, you know, six defensive ends on the initial 53 man roster. That includes Daniel Hardy, who I I'm, I'm enthusiastic in him being rewarded for the production he had, not only on games in the preseason, but throughout training camp, like the dude brought it every day and was rewarded. If you're building culture, you show people that the guys that produce and give you what you want every single day deserve to make the spot. And then Dom Robinson, who's another guy, a draft pick. Uh, that, that Ryan Poles brought in a couple of years ago, who's giving it another chance, you know, to, to try to continue developing. I think inside the building, they see some development occurring. We're still waiting for it to translate into on-field production. And those are, those are two of the guys I think also that when the roster came out, you say, okay, those are, those are notable inclusions uh, before we get to the exclusions. 
couple questions that you can help interpret. So when you look at a guy like Dom Robinson, like Daniel Hardy, who may have played his way onto the roster, what is their status if, say, our colleague Brad Biggs reports that Kari Blassingame, who didn't make the 53-man roster, might be coming back in a way that, that helps him um, to stay as, as part of the mix. One of these guys, the 53rd man who makes it, might be out of a job tomorrow. How does that work, and why is that the case? Uh, well, you know, you have to do some roster mechanics here to get through these next several days as you're trying to manipulate the roster with injury issues. The understanding per Brad's reporting is that Patrick Scales, kept on the initial 53-man roster today, will be put on injured reserve tomorrow, still dealing with a back injury that he suffered earlier in training camp and hasn't recovered from. And so at that point, now you have a roster spot to give. And so in order to keep that uh, roster spot, you've got a vested veteran in Kerry Blazing game who, who was cut today. He's free to sign with anyone else, but the agreement is sort of in, in principle with the bears that we're going to let him go. We're going to bring him back in the same contract tomorrow and he's going to fill this roster spot. And we're just going to continue to, to kind of sift through these pieces there. The scales conversation is one we can have in a couple minutes, but you do have some things injury wise that you have to manipulate. You mentioned Hardy as well in the six defensive ends that the bears kept, I'm really interested to see whether this becomes a trend because there seems to be a thought process in some pockets of the league that the new kickoff rules have changed some of the body types and players that you need to cover kicks. You don't have to have guys that are incredibly fast to run down as soon as the ball is kicked and be in position to make a tackle, you know, shortly after it's caught with the way guys are aligning. Now you can, you can play bigger bodies there and treat it. They're already there more of a traditional running play. And so, so maybe that's part of the rationale between keeping six. We always caution people and you've heard it in our conversations that this is the initial 53 man roster. I remember years where the bears had, you know, six tight ends on the initial 53 man roster and everyone went crazy. And then by the time they got to the Wednesday of week one, there were three and, and you said, Oh, okay. So that was just a, a little bit of a, a transition period. And, 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 you know, you have to monitor other teams waiver claims and figure this out, figure that out and try to figure out what's best for you. But I, I don't know if that answers your question directly, but hopefully it gives a little bit of an understanding of all of the moving parts that go into these decisions. It makes me think that when scales goes on IR, that the blasting game will come back and replace him on the 53. But that then the other part sense. of that is you're ultimately going to have to sign a long snapper to take you into week one. And they cut their uh, fill in long snapper, Cameron Lyons, who had been with them since scales got hurt early in training camp. And the, the, the thought process here now is you're going to be exploring the waiver wire. Or you're going to be exploring street free agency to try to find a guy in with some experience that can go into a game because you would hate to have Caleb Williams' debut as the Chicago Bears quarterback be defined by a unproven long snapper who makes a mistake in a big moment. Yeah, that would not be good, and I don't think that would be good planning. They must have an agreement with uh, the player they – remind me, the player they cut to who is is the, done the long snapping during preseason. Cameron Lyons, but I, yeah, like if, yeah, I yeah, think Cam I, Lyons. They, Cam Lyons, they, yeah. I think that, I think they may be exploring other more experienced options there to, hmm. to figure that whole thing out, and so that's going to be interesting in the next few days. I think that's a risk. Don't you think that's there. a risk? Don't you think that's a calculated risk? If you if you got a guy who um, hasn't been part of your organization, the timing you got a rookie punter who's your holder, you don't have a you don't have a tried and true operation. You're right. Caleb Williams' debut may come down to the last second field goal. You yeah, it's yeah. not the it's not ideal. Suboptimal, and so that's one of the the injury moves here that that we're talking about. Dante Pettis today placed on season-ending injured reserve. Two guys uh, with the new NFL revisions that you can keep two guys without using one of your 53-man roster spots. Put them on IR and designate them to return. Uh, Jacob Martin on defense, Larry Borum on offense. So those guys stick around. They are ineligible to play in the regular season through for the first four games, and then we'll reevaluate from there. How surprised are you that Larry Borum and the team did not come to an injury settlement given his $3 million salary? And do you think that he is somebody that they look at now as if he's making he's pretty valuable moving forward, I would think, because if they wanted to get rid of him, they had an opportunity. Keeping him, I think, speaks to how much they might value him. It'll be interesting to see where they go with this because a lot of this comes down to what you're doing at your backup tackle position. Right now, it feels like Matt Pryor slots in as your swing tackle for the month of September. Karan Amagaji obviously just recently um, 
returning to practice or, or entering practice for the first time to be more uh, specific on that front. And so you, you, you're trying to figure that out as you go. They kept 10 offensive linemen in addition to Larry Borum on the active 53 man roster here. And so usually you keep nine or 10 Borum would make 11. And so now you, uh, you, you know, you're just going to have to, to kind of feel that out and understand how fluid the situation is going to be uh, through the first month or two of the season. What do you make of the fact that bears now have easily the youngest quarterback room in the league. <laughs> they let Brett Rippon go, probably a candidate to be on the practice squad. I can't see another team maybe claiming Brett Rippon. There are a lot of good qualified quarterbacks who hit the street this afternoon. I look at the Bears with Tyson Bajant and, and Kayla Williams. Tyson Bajant, the grizzled veteran backup. Uh, youth being served, I don't feel like it's a huge concern for the Bears. I feel like they probably – believe that their quarterback room is among one of the strengths of their team right now. No, look, and I, I think you do want to try to get Brett Rippon back because I just think that it, it, as the regular season begins, you want to have some level of experience in that room to be able to, to kind of help you with your homework, preparing for the next opponent, figuring out what to look at, what to see. And so I think in an ideal world, he'll be back here before the weekends. As far as QB1 and QB2 goes, this is what I've expected since March before the Bears even drafted uh, Caleb Williams, that this was what it was going to look like. They had such heartfelt belief in the direction that Tyson Bajant was going with his development. They obviously fell in love with, with Caleb during the pre-draft process and the love affair has only exploded since then. Uh, they feel good about what they're walking into the season with. And obviously you've got playmakers all around uh, and, and now you just try to squeeze the most out of, out of your rookie and, and get him to understand week by week what you need out of him to win that week's game. And that, that's going to be pretty interesting as we go forward with Caleb. Got to tell you that I know I w wasn't surprised because I do think that draft picks receive preferential treatment. But when Noah Sewell makes the team and Micah Baskerville and Carl Jones Jr. do not, I think you're speaking to what we're talking about. The draft status outweighed the production in the preseason. Nobody's going to make too big of a stink over – backup linebackers getting cut or being here or there. But Dan, that was a decision that was had to have been tough to explain to both Baskerville and Carl Jones Jr., even though they're likely to be practice squad candidates. Yeah. I mean, your hope obviously is that they don't get claimed. Baskerville has had a little bit more of splash. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think there's always some fear that's irrational in the pockets of social media about guys that are going to get claimed elsewhere. These yeah. other teams have been very, very focused on their own building and the guys they know and the guys that they've been evaluating. And it, it, it takes a lot to turn someone else's heads to make a waiver claim in those situations. So I do expect uh, basketball at the very least to be back in the practice squad before the end of the week. And, and we'll see if Carl Jones Jr. Falls into that, that crowd as well. Uh, and at that point with a 17 man practice squad now, it's, this is different than it used to be. You've got, more roster flexibility and more ability to develop guys than you've had before. And I think that's a, a plus for the league because it, it does create continuity for the player. It does create continuity for the team and it allows guys to kind of see through some of their growth process as opposed to having to, to, to get launched into a new uh, organization, a new scenery, all that stuff that, that makes it a little hard to adapt. I agree with that. And yet I, I can find somebody I think falls into the category of a player that other teams likely will claim because cornerback is such a premium in the mm -hmm. league. Greg Stroman Jr. is a guy who good enough to be on the Bears. It just speaks to the depth of their secondary that he got cut today. He's a veteran who had some good flash moments last year uh, with the team and yeah. couldn't really crack in the lineup after that because of the depth of the position. But I think Greg Stroman Jr. got bad news today. But I don't. I don't think he'll be unemployed for, for long. No, I don't think so either. I think that is probably the name that, that when I go down the list of the Bears cuts, that's the one most likely to get claimed elsewhere. Really good player, helps you on special teams, can do some things at the cornerback position with some versatility that, that helps you. It's just a numbers game. I mean, when you look at the, their depth at corner and, and you walk into the regular season with Jalen Johnson, Kyler Gordon, Tyreek Stevenson, Terrell Smith, Jalen Jones, and Josh Blackball, you go, man, there's not much weakness here. And I know inside the building, there's an incredible amount of enthusiasm for the continued growth of Josh Blackwell. 
in the nickel position, the guy that can come in if Kyler Gordon is out for any reason and can give you production there in a way that's meaningful to this defense. You hear Matt Eberflus talk about it all the time, that that nickel position in this defense can be one that that is uh, a real impact, uh, has a real impact. And and so Blackwell is a guy that, that, that gives you that really good on special teams since the day he got here a couple of years ago. Uh, so that, you know, that, that, that group of six is, I mean, you circle that and you go, man, you feel pretty lucky to, to, to be, to be having those six guys with you. Was there anything about the decisions made today by Ryan Poles and his staff that surprised you? No, not overall. I think the, the Blazing game cut initially was like, uh Oh, you know, like, uh, does that mean they're not going with a fullback? Are they going to try to keep another, tight end is there anything there but then you learn that he's going to probably be back (laughs) the next time they hit the practice field so no real worries there you know i'm looking down through the list of guys i had circled as as curious if they were going to make it or not and there's just there wasn't a lot you know we did talk you and i the other day on the radio about doug kramer right and why is doug kramer making the 53-man roster well doug kramer is making this 53-man roster in big part because ryan bates isn't healthy right now and four weeks ago, we were talking about Ryan Bates being the front runner to be the starting center in week one for the Bears. And now Coleman Shelton has won that job. And now Doug Kramer is needed in week one to be your backup center. And so that's one of those situations where the trade that the Bears made to get Ryan Bates to bring him in. Obviously, Ryan Poles' attraction dates back two plus years on Ryan, Ryan Bates. It is a little bit. I don't want to say tainted, but whatever one word less than tainted is right now, because Ryan Bates is dealing with a shoulder issue that he can't seem to shake. And now they're having to troubleshoot a little bit on the offensive line. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of see how that unfolds in the weeks ahead, because, you know, Bates was not only supposed to be your starting center, he was also supposed to be the option at guard if Nate Davis ever misses time. And oh, by the way, Nate Davis has been prone to missing time. So <laughs> now you've got to kind of play that game as well. Away from the Bears, did you see some of the cuts around the league? The, I, I was surprised, and I haven't been following it that closely, to be honest with you, but Allen Robinson uh, got cut, and I wonder um, where he ends up. And I also wonder, from a Bears perspective, that uh, Terrell Edmonds, the safety, got cut. Uh, he's the brother of Tremaine Edmonds, and I don't know – I don't know how much he has left in the tank. Dan, he's a pretty – I think he's 27 years old. And uh, you, you do wonder if – because I, I don't know if he's on the Bears' radar or not, but I think those two players uh, were among the names that stood out of guys who, who who got cut today that I just didn't expect to see. Yeah, I haven't taken a long look at the, the rest of the league and, and what the most notable names were on that list. The Allen Robinson thing is fascinating for me because you just felt like – 2018 he was still ascending as a as a playmaking receiver and then he ran into some contract squabble issues here with the previous regime at Hellas Hall and his career never got back on track you expected him to, to go somewhere else and produce and and do the things that he thought he was capable of and, and and the things that he had shown he was capable of and he just really has never found stride since <laughs> since that first uh stretch in Chicago where he was very productive for, for a winning football team here. And so, um, you know, one day maybe we'll get him on the podcast and he can, uh, he can g- give us his own insight into to why things went the direction they did in, in, in his time in Chicago. And then afterwards, what happens to Austin Reed now? I don't know. I mean, this is, you know, one of those Cinderella stories that took on a life of its own in part because of hard knocks. Um, good story. He was kind of trying to recreate the Tyson Bajan magic from a year ago as a division two guy that came in and, and, and tried to do his best to, to earn a spot here. There just wasn't a place for him here. It's a hard league, you know, and, and sometimes like really good players who are really good people just don't stick because it's a numbers game. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't know if we'll, we'll, we'll see him uh, anywhere else. Uh, if anybody sees a, a, a practice squad spot for him, I, I, I just, you know, there's been some thought here. Oh, the bears will keep four. I, that just makes no sense to me. There's just not enough to do, <laughs> you know, to, 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 to use a practice squad spot on a guy like that when you're already developing two other quarterbacks, you know, it's not like, Oh, we'll take on this developmental project just in case Well, you got your guy that you hope is your starter for the next 10 to 12 years. And you've got your backup who you think is really good and, and, and still developing. So, uh, I don't see Austin Reed having a future at Hallis Hall. If I'm wrong, uh, I will explain why I'm wrong uh, <laughs> on an episode or two up the road here. I'm on Og Bang Bamiga. Easy for me to say. Easy say it again. Jeff. Og Bang Bamiga. <laughs> that was better. 
Okay, thank you. I didn't, <laughs> I, listen, I'm no Joniak, all right? <laughs> the fact that he is on this roster is one of those uh, maybe that would qualify as a surprise, and you wonder if he's a guy that they are um, invested in and how much – Special teamer. The, special teamer. That's his that's – yeah. his. That's yeah, he's gonna here, right? he's gonna be a core special teamer guy for you, and then obviously you know you've got you you've got Edmonds and, and TJ starting for you. Sanborn's been very productive, and 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 yeah. So then it, basically it's Sewell and and OG as I'm gonna call him here. And oh, well, you, 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 uh, you just have to spell it. You don't have to. <laughs> say Agbang Bamiga. Agbang Bamiga. Agbang Bamiga. Bamiga. Remember, it's this is a guy to... who who yeah. spent uh, about a month of his professional life learning how to spell K R Z Y Z E W S K I. So I can yeah. get down. Ogmong Mamiga here pretty easily. There was some speculation that maybe Mercedes Lewis would be a surprise cut. I, obviously, with their offensive tackle situation, keeping him makes a lot of sense. I think the big dog still has some uh, bark in him, if you will. And I just thought that if they were going to bring him back, they were going to keep him. 40 years old, season 19. He was brought back for a purpose in June as a guy who they think can um, really be a tone setter in the run game on offense and then uh, a, a direction setter inside the locker room as a guy who knows how to survive in this league, who knows how to create habits that allow you to uh, survive in this league. And, and, and so I think, uh, I think they're really leaning into the leadership of, of Mercedes Lewis as well as his ability to be an asset in the run game. Uh, it's interesting you, you, you bring up Mercedes Lewis because I'll have a piece at chicagotribune.com later this week about why he is still doing this and why he felt like Chicago was the place to do it for 2024. Those, those are excellent questions. I can't wait to read the answers. So Roshan Johnson never was in danger of missing out on a roster spot, but when's the last time we saw anything from Roshan Johnson? What's his status? Uh, really strange camp. And he was banged up. One of the problems with the current, policy that Matty Berflus has of not giving anyone any intel at all on what the injury issues are is that you're left to kind of be like, okay, what's going on with Roshan and what, why has he not been more um, attention worthy during training camp? Why hasn't he shown up in the preseason game actions? We know how highly this organization talked about him when he was a rookie. We know what they thought he could be in year two. And so now I think we go into the regular season trying to figure out kind of what that pecking order in the backfield is going to look like little Herbert's still around DeAndre Swift obviously is going to be your your lead dog uh and, and so now yeah I mean you ask a a pretty valid question that that is worth following up on uh, as we get a chance here in the coming weeks to talk to everybody from Ryan Pohl should speak on Wednesday so he'll give some insight and then uh I, I would imagine within the next nine or ten days we'll get another crack at some of the Bears' assistant coaches to, to get a, a progress report as well. Back to the pass rush on the defensive line. Austin Booker, of course, makes this team. I think it's interesting that Daryl Taylor, the trade, uh, the, the Seahawk that got traded to the Bears over the weekend, 21 and a half sacks in the last three seasons, seems like he's going to play uh, a great deal. Does he start, Dan, or is that the Marcus Walker's job and it's a rotational situation? Does it matter? Flu said over the weekend that they were going to, play the hot hand, you know, it was going to be Montez sweat and the hot hand. And so I, I, it, it's going to be interesting to see how the reps are distributed in the first month of the season. I know obviously the bears love to come up with that rush package, that, that group of four where you would expect the Marcus Walker to kick inside on obvious passing downs and, and Andrew Billings would come off the field. And then, and then you'd have an opportunity to, to, to bring one of those other guys in, whether it's Booker, whether it's Taylor, whether it's uh, a, a glimpse here or there of, of Hardy or, or, or Dom Robinson. But, like, I need to get a better feel for how they want to distribute these reps. And the Taylor thing's interesting to me because he was a 3-4 edge rusher in Seattle. And then Seattle came in and was installing a 4-3 defense, and they, they didn't see him. Uh, as part of their plans going forward. And now he comes here to play a 4-3 in Matt's system. They, they like his disposition. They like the way he he hustles and 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 can do some things lined up wide. Um, I need to see it, right? Like, cause it, does, it doesn't seem like this is an obvious schematic fit right out of the jump. And, and you want to kind of get a feel for, for what it is that they believed in. And yet that's what, that's the way they explained it was that it was a better scheme fit here because of the way that they could, I, I felt like that was what they were trying to say without necessarily saying it. But the fact that they think he fits here better did it, and, he, and they like his motor and they like his, 
the traits and maybe he was just the best available pass rusher in a trade. And that's, that's, it came down to nothing more difficult or complicated than that. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it gives you a little bit of competition and it heightens the urgency in that room and, and, and we'll see where they go with it. Um, you know, look like, I mean, the other part for me today is like when you finally get that release that says, here's, here's the cuts, here's the 53 man roster, you go, okay, it's go time now. Like, like we are ready for the regular season, you know, and it, it like, it is Titans week starting in about 12 minutes <laughs> on my clock, right? Like we, we, we extend Titans week and, and the bears get to dive into regular season prep because I just, this team, I think, especially with the extended runway due to the hall of fame game of tra- training camp has, We've talked about a lot of things, and now it's time to, to, to test all of these things, right, on the, on the stage and under the bright lights of, of the regular season. And and so I speak for uh, – I'll take it upon myself to speak for the Take the North podcast to say hallelujah, you know, like bring on week one because it's it's time to get to the real action. And let me be the first to say that when it comes to Titans week and their quarterback, that Will Levis stinks. <laughs> Literally. He has male perfume. Or cologne. Did you see that? He sold did not. mayo cologne. He's bottling mayo flavored or not flavored mayo <laughs> fragrance uh, after mayonnaise. Mayonnaise smells terribly. So oh, I can gross. safely say Will Levis stinks. Gross. Are you for real with this? There's a mayonnaise flavored cologne? Look it up. He sold it by the bottle. He's raising some money for a good cause. I love that he's maybe doing that for a good cause. But mayonnaise cologne that smells like mayonnaise why i'm not What's in on next that. monster not in cheese that. in a bottle i mean come on it's just like awful awful maybe i'll wear some of that to the opener at soldier field and see how many people maybe i get carve out some more room in the press box he also puts mayo in his coffee that's the whole idea remember pre-draft that was the whole story with will levis i'm glad he's oh, yeah. not a bear speaking of quarterbacks before we wrap up i didn't get a chance to talk to you um after you guys talked about the interview you had with Caleb Williams, which was outstanding and has been all over the radio this week, which has been great. And the story was terrific. Um, I just have to say that like he, he has been consistent. The Tim Grover stuff was really, really interesting. And I have yet to hear something that makes you say like, well, that seems disingenuous or, oh boy, that seems like a phony. He was as good with you as he has been with, with everyone that he has dealt with. And it seems like with everyone he deals with, he seems to establish a pretty easy rapport. And that is enjoyable. Wired for greatness. That's undeniable. And then what you're describing there is a connection quality that the people inside the building at Hallis Hall believe is incredibly rare. And and in my experience is, I I mean, I've told you numerous times that when I walked into the, you know, charity event the day before the draft and and had my first opportunity to speak with him face to face not counting the combine when i was shouting from a pack 150 deep there in the indianapolis convention center he's been nothing but sincere and genuine and willing to engage in any conversation you want to engage him in and it's like you understand why coaches and and front office execs and teammates are all sort of rallying behind him because they feel the same sort of magnetic qualities there and more than anything they feel that ambition that he has and backs it up with the want to learn right like i think that's what 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 makes him really different is he goes out of his way to find resources and avenues to improve and grow and learn and try to figure out what made the greats the greats tom brady michael jordan kobe bryant you know aaron Rodgers. go run on down the list he's a student of excellence and 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 that came across in our conversation last week which was published this week uh and it's going to be really fun to, to to continue watching his uh his career unfold i think you said something on the radio today that that i think sums it up really well i i think you said the more you hear from caleb williams the more you want to hear from caleb williams yes no doubt about it. He's just one of those guys that uh, is. it just seems like we're just getting started in terms of getting really to know the young man who is you know just tremendous on the field and, and, and just compelling off of it as well. And not compelling in the way that maybe a lot of people expected. This is a guy that is definitely 
uh, doing everything right as a rookie. And you just can see greatness because you can see what other people have, have, have cited when they said he's going to be a great one. The uh, last thing his- I'll say on that 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 topic, and, and this is from a conversation I had with Cole Komet one-on-one, which I'll, I'll have parts of this next week in a story I'm writing on Cole. But I said, look, like, are, are you aware that as much as this team talks about having playoff aspirations in 2024 and as good as everyone feels about the direction this team is going, the rookie quarterback's not going to be a finished product by the end of September. And Cole said, the cool thing about it is Caleb understands that you only need to be good enough on that specific Sunday to win a game. And so you can still be successful while improving along the way, as long as you understand what is needed from you within that given week and that given game and that given situation inside of the game to win the football game. And they feel like he's got a really grounded grasp of that and that that's going to be a little bit uh, of another X X factor for a guy who has so many other special traits. It's a great point. His presence on this roster, along with the other guys on it, make you feel like for the first time in the long time as the Bears get their roster set for a season, that this is a team that can, I'm not going to say finish in the playoffs, but they can make a legitimate run to get there and they're going to be competitive and in contention, or at least they have enough talent to say that's not ridiculous. And that's something that is progress as we sit here at the end of August. Yeah. And I think that the excitement that you're feeling from, from most people is that this isn't just about 2024. Like it's, it's absolutely understandable to be excited about 2024, but I think that the giddiness that is kind of bubbled up in Chicago is like, Oh man, like the rest of the decade has a chance to be really fun. Now, look, you and I are not going to get out in front of our skis and, and not go too far down that road. But it does seem with the core that they have assembled, including the quarterback and including some of the, the key pieces like DJ Moore and Montez Sweat and Cole Komet and other guys like that, you've got a group here now that, that can legitimately open that window and keep the window open. And I think that's where some of that enthusiasm really, really amplifies. We'll be here later in the week to tell you more about what Ryan Poles had to say and the direction the Bears are headed. So for today, that's all we've got. For Adam Sadzinski, our producer, for Dan Weeder from the Chicago Tribune, I'm David Hoff on the Mullen Haw Show. Thank you for listening to the Take the North podcast on your free Odyssey app. Thank you for watching us on the 670 Scores YouTube page. We'll talk to you next time. Great talk. See you out there.